Well, uh, what I'd like to do is actually pick back up where we were yesterday and just finish out the classification of Psalms. And I went through my sermon notes and uh, went through the vault that I brought with me. And uh, we'll look at a couple of these and, and uh, you may see them and go, is that all there is? Uh, but I, I think the value will be just the thinking process of putting together uh, an expository message and kind of what fits in where and the rhyme and the reason and we can just uh, pick it apart together. And uh, so we'll do that uh, here in just a little bit. So we've got that uh, out in front of us. Uh, I'm on lesson two on page 60 uh, looking at the kingly psalms and uh, last time together we finished looking at the uh, teaching psalms and the Torah psalms, the didactic psalms, and we, we need to be aware of just a few more classifications of psalms that I think will be helpful uh, to us uh, in preaching the psalms. And again, to make this point, uh, they tend to unfold in similar ways, and so that's really why it's worth looking at this because as we construct a certain outline for a sermon, there are some major hooks on which we hang uh, our, our thoughts as we preach through them. So in considering the, these kingly psalms, these focus on the earthly king of Israel, the Davidic king, and sometimes that is David and sometimes it is in David's household, and ultimately... Uh, these look ahead to the greater son of David, the Lord Jesus Christ himself. So, considering the royal psalms, they describe the reign of the king of Israel and his many conquests over foreign powers that threatened their national security. And I've listed here uh, these royal psalms, uh, Psalm 2, 18, 20, 21, 45, 72, 89, and a great example is Psalm 2, which we've already talked about, positioned right here at the outset of, of the Psalter. And, and there is a, a fairly repeatable theme that is woven through these um, royal psalms. And the main heading, it begins in Psalm 2, and this is repeated in the other psalms, sometimes in, in a different sequence in order. But, but there is the, the enemies of the Lord and the enemies of the king. And in David's day, it spoke of the foreign powers and foreign nations that were rising up to oppress uh, Israel and these real threats upon the security of the people of God. And so in Psalm 2, for example, why are the nations in an uproar and the peoples devising a vain thing? Uh, the kings of the earth take their stand and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against His anointed, saying, let us tear their fetters apart and cast away their cords from us. And these foreign powers now rising up against Israel and the Davidic king, and his anointed in David's day, referring to the king who was anointed by God, empowered by the Holy Spirit of God to rule as king and who was so identified with the heavenly king. And so this close connection between heaven's king, Yahweh, and the Davidic king, David, and anointed and empowered by God, and these surrounding nations uh, in opposition uh, against Israel. And of course, when we read the New Testament, uh, this is carried out in the crucifixion of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ as the Jews and the Romans rose up uh, against Christ and, and against God, and in essence, throwing off the, the yoke of God's sovereignty and God's Word and God's Lordship over their lives. And, and that's really what unbelief is. It, it is a, uh, a resistance to the rule and reign of God over a man's heart. And so there are the Lord's enemies, and within their own heart, uh, let us tear their fetters together and cast away their cords. We will not come under the authority of God's Word. 
and ultimately even looking ahead to the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ as the kings of the earth, Revelation 17, Revelation 13, uh, will rise up against God and against His anointed in the end times. And so then there is the theme of the Lord's sovereignty uh, as we read in Psalm 2 verse, verse 4, He who sits in the heavens laughs, but it's a joke that's not even funny. It's the, it's the laugh of derision. It is the laugh of mockery uh, that, that puny man would resist almighty God. And, and God just laughs at the insanity of that thought that even all the kings of the earth collectively would, see, would seek to overthrow his sovereign eternal decree from before time began. And so he who sits in the heavens laughs, the Lord scoffs at them and their, the futility of their rebellion against his kingdom. Then he will speak to them in his anger and terrify them in his fury, saying, but as for me, I have installed my king upon Zion my holy mountain, and this, the, this sense of the overruling uh, uh, display of divine sovereignty over the kings of the earth that would rise up against His appointed King. And then the Lord's victory that is ushered in as a result of the, the, uh, the display of God's sovereignty, verse 7 of Psalm 2, I will surely tell the decree of the Lord. He said to me, you are my son, today I have begotten you. Ask of me and I will surely give the nations as your inheritance, the very ends of the earth as your possession. And the next verse is so important. He will inherit them to judge them. He will possess them to damn them. You shall break them with a rod of iron. You shall shatter them like earthenware. And Revelation 19 uh, echoes these very words uh, fulfilled at the time of the second coming of the Lord's anointed, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ, as the kings of the earth gather together the valley of Megiddo to fight that last great battle of Armageddon, and Christ will burst on the scene riding his white horse, and, and the door opened in heaven, and on his thigh faithful and true, and a name given to him that no one knows, meaning we cannot even comprehend the enormity and how exponential is his sovereignty as he comes back to conquer and to crush and to control the earth. And so the fulfillment of that, and so the, then comes the, the psalmist counsel, now therefore, O king, show discernment. Take warning, O oh, judges of the earth. I mean, you need to think through the, the, the utter insanity of your unbelief to refuse God and to refuse His King. Worship the Lord with reverence and rejoice with trembling. Do homage to the Son that He may not become angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath may soon be kindled. How blessed are all who take refuge in Him. And so this is kind of the main uh, flow of these royal psalms. God has established His King and He has anointed His King to reign. There is always opposition against His King. And the victory that this king, first the Davidic king, ultimately the greater king, Christ, is achieved not through chariots and not through swords, but the victory belongs to God to give. And the key is this, it is the relationship of the earthly king to the heavenly king. Victory is not found in horses and chariots and shields and swords. It is not found in, in, in the king's counsel to rise up and defend himself. Victory is found in the earthly king being rightly related to the heavenly king. And if the earthly king will come under submission to the heavenly king and honor and praise the heavenly king, 
then the heavenly king will give victory to the earthly king. And so that is the unfolding of the message of the royal Psalms, that victory belongs to God and to God alone to give. Psalm 20 is a, is a great psalm that, that, uh, that, that really echoes uh, the same as the people of God gather around the Davidic king um, and the people pray for the, for the Davidic king. Uh, psalm 20, may the Lord answer you. And that you is, uh, is the earthly king. It is, in this case, I believe, David. And so the people gather around David before he goes out into battle and before he goes out to war. May the Lord answer you in the day of trouble. And the day of trouble is, are the foreign oppressors rising up against Israel. May the name of the God of Jacob set you securely on high. May he send you help from the sanctuary, and that sanctuary meaning the, the heavenly sanctuary. May your help come to you from the throne of God and support you from Zion, and this Zion being the heavenly Zion. May he remember all your meal offerings and find your burnt offering acceptable. In other words, may your heart be right with God. May you be found acceptable with God. Verse 4, may he grant you your, heart, your heart's desire. These are the people continuing to, to, to intercede on behalf of the royal king. May he grant your heart's desire. This is like 1 Timothy 2, 1 and 2, that all petition be given to uh, be made on behalf of those who are in authority over you. And fulfill all your counsel. We will sing for joy over your victory because your victory as the earthly king will be our victory. As it goes with you will be how it will go with us. We will sing for joy over your victory, verse 5. In the name of our God, we will lift up our banners. And these banners being a declaration of the names of God. May the Lord fulfill all your petitions. And it presupposes that their earthly king will be seeking God in the secret place and calling upon him for help. And now verse 6. Uh, the people sense the answer to their prayers. Uh, th they sense that they have been heard by God as they have prayed for their earthly king. Now I know that the Lord saves his anointed, that God will deliver the Davidic king out of this hour of crisis and this Davidic king being the Lord's anointed. He will answer him, the him referring to the, the royal king, the earthly king. He, God, will answer him, the earthly king, from his holy heaven with the saving strength of his right hand. And so what they are saying in prayer is, is that the victory will come not from their armies, but the victory will come from the Lord of hosts in heaven. So verse 7, some boast in chariots and some in horses, but we will boast in the name of the Lord our God. Now, they do have chariots, and they do have horses, but they are not trusting in them. Their victory will come from God exclusively. It will be God's to give or God's to withhold, and it will be dependent upon their relationship to, have the, to the heavenly king, specifically the earthly king's relationship to the heavenly king. That's why they are so praying for the earthly king. Verse 8, they have bowed down and fallen, referring to their enemies, but we have risen and stood upright. God will make them fall, yet He will cause us to stand. And so in verse 9, save, O Lord, deliver out of this temporal crisis, rescue us out of this hour. May the King... Heaven's king, answer us in the day we call. So this is a, a, a royal psalm, which is offered on behalf of the earthly king. 
that God would grant to him the victory as he will lead them out into battle. But we will trust not in our human resources. We will trust exclusively in the name of the Lord our God. So these are, these are powerful, powerful um, psalms. Um, psalm 18 is, is, is one of these. Um, and, and we see the, oppre- the, the, the enemies rising up against the earthly king uh, in verse 3 when he says, I am saved from my enemies. Uh, the cords of death encompassed me and the, and the torrents of ungodliness terrified me. As, the, as, as David, now the king to be, is chased by Saul and even this king to be David who has already been anointed by the prophet Samuel. I love you, O Lord, my strength. The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer, my God, my rock in whom I take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my stronghold. I call upon the Lord who is worthy to be praised and I am saved from my enemies." So th- this is just kind of the flow of these, these, uh, these royal psalms. Um, let's look. Um, come, come to the end of the 90s, psalm in the, psalms in the 90s, uh, the, the enthronement psalms. And th- this is the reoccurring theme here is that the Lord reigns. Um, When I was in chapel in October, I I preached Psalm 93, and and I just love these psalms. It's like getting in the elevator and punching penthouse, and you just go all the way to the top, and you have a view from heaven's perspective, and you see all of life from the highest pinnacle, and what you see is that the Lord reigns over all. And so, uh, there is this declaration that the Lord reigns. Uh, He begins, the Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. Uh, The Lord has clothed and girded Himself with strength. And and this reoccurring anthem that the Lord reigns, um, Psalm 96, verse 10, say among the nations, the Lord reigns. Psalm 97, 1, the Lord reigns, let the earth rejoice. Psalm 99, verse 1, the Lord reigns, let the peoples tremble. And the reason for this is that outward circumstances would indicate otherwise. In hours of crisis, as it looks, as Israel's circumstances look to be in chaos, uh, look to be uh, out of, things look to be out of control. They are pointed upward to the heavenly king and that God has not usurped his reign. God has not been impeached. God remains upon his throne and he rules even in this very hour. So the Lord reigns. He is clothed with majesty. Majesty meaning the splendor, uh, the pomp of, of a regal king, clothed himself with strength, and his sovereignty over all of creation, all that he has made, all that his hands have made, he reigns over it, the end of verse 1. Indeed, the world is firmly established. It will not be moved. Everything is in its rightful place, exactly where God has assigned it. And there it will continue to be. And he's not having to realign the planets or things on this earth. His sovereignty is also extended uh, over time from all eternity past. Verse 2, your throne is established from of old. You are from everlasting. God is reigning now as God has always reigned from eternity past. And his reign in the present is but the extension of his sovereign decree.
from eternity past. And He reigns over the nations, verse 3. Uh, the floods have lifted up, O Lord, the floods have lifted up their voice. The floods lift up their pounding waves. And what is sp being spoken here is not that God is sovereign over the physical waves, but the angry uh, turmoil of the nations that are likened unto uh, flood tides here. And God reigns over the nations. Remember in Revelation 13 how the beast emerges out of the sea. And the picture there is out of the chaos of the last days. Um, and out of the chaos of the nations will emerge this man who will be the devil's incarnation. Well, the same here, and yet God is shown as in verse 4, more than the sounds of many waters, more than the, than the, 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 the waves saying, we will not have this man reign over us. Nevertheless, verse 4, the Lord, the Lord on high is mighty. That is to say, He is the King of kings, and He is the Lord of lords. And what Proverbs 21, verse 1 says, the heart of the king is in the hand of the Lord, and His rivers of water, He channels it whichever way He will. As it says in Revelation 17, that God put it into the hearts of the unsaved kings to execute His eternal decree. God governing even through pagan, unconverted kings in the last hour. We read in the book of, of, of Isaiah how God raised up Cyrus and called him my servant, yet he was an unconverted man, yet he was the Lord's servant because he would perform the Lord's bidding. And it's an argument from the greater to the lesser if God sovereignly controls even unconverted kings, how much more those who are not enthroned. This is, as he said of Pharaoh in Romans 9, I raised you up for this very purpose, that I might use you for my own end. Th this is our God, and this is the God whom we worship, and this is the God whom these enthronement psalms declare. I mean, we, we need to preach these enthronement psalms. We need to pull these out about once every other month and just remind people who God is. And in seeing who God is, it reminds us who we are. And the higher we lift up God and the lower we reveal man to be who he truly is, really the greater we magnify the grace of God that has spanned that difference and the lower God is and the higher man is, it's a very small grace that has saved us. But when God is the most high God above the heavens and man is in the pit and in the mire of sin, now we have amazing grace. How sweet the sound. An infinite chasm has been spanned. That is God-honoring preaching that comes through these psalms. And so he says in verse 5, here is even his sovereignty over his own people. You see the unfolding here, God's sovereignty over creation, verse 1, his sovereignty over time and eternity, verse 2, his sovereignty over the pagan nations, verses 3 and 4, but even now his sovereignty over his own people, verse 5. Your testimonies are fully confirmed. His testimonies, meaning His Word, that God executes His government in the midst of His people being mediated through the teaching and preaching of His testimonies and of His Word. And as God's Word is proclaimed, there is a top to bottom unfolding and layering out of God's sovereign reign. And what does it produce in the lives of His people when His testimonies and when His Word is made known? Holiness befits your house. Like produces like. And God's holy Word produces holiness in the lives of His people, and it befits your house, O Lord, forever. 
So these are the enthronement psalms, and they are powerful, and they are regal, and they are noble, and they declare, as A.W. Pink says, that God is God, that being the definition of his sovereignty, that God is simply God, not merely in name only, but in the execution of all of his attributes and all of his character, God is God. We come to the imprecatory psalms, the end of page 62, and, and these are filled with fiery zeal bleeding out of the heart of the psalmist for the justice of God, for the holiness of God. And really, these are not self-vindictive psalms because the psalmist never takes any of these matters into his own hands. He simply calls upon God to be God and calls upon God to do what is right upon the earth. There are individual imprecatory psalms. There are community imprecatory psalms. Uh, Psalm 35 is an example of an imprecatory psalm, and uh, these individual ones, Psalm 35, 55, 59, 79, 109, uh, surrounded again by Israel's enemies, the psalmist pleads for God to intervene. Psalm 35, 1, contend, O Lord, with those who contend with me. Fight against those who fight against me. Now notice, David is not saying, I am taking matters in my own hands. He is asking God to intervene and to fight his battle for him. Take hold of buckler and shield and rise up for my help. In other words, God, equip yourself that you might go forth into battle for me. Draw also the spear and the battle axe to meet those who pursue me. Say to my soul, I am your salvation. God, preach to my heart. Remind me that I am your deliverer. I will burst on the scene and intervene on your behalf, and you will not have to take vengeance into your own hands. I will defend you and I will fight for you. I say to your soul, I am your salvation. So verse 19, do not let those who are wrongfully my enemies rejoice over me. And and it's not a a self-centered request. It's because David is identified with Yahweh, and if he is defeated, then the nations will say, where is your God? Bring victory to me so that they may know who you are, God. Do not let those who are wrongfully my enemies rejoice over me, nor let those who hate me without cause wink maliciously. For they do not speak peace, but they devise deceitful words against those who are quiet in the land. They open their mouths wide against me. They say, aha, our eyes have seen it. You have seen it. O Lord, do not keep silent. O Lord, do not be far from me. Stir up yourself. Rouse yourself, God. Awake to my right and to my cause, my God and my Lord. Judge me, O Lord, my God, according to your righteousness. And do not let them rejoice over me. This is not a self-righteous man looking down his long nose at others. He invites God's, inter- God's judgment within his own heart in the midst of this. God, judge me and then go forth and judge them. Do not let them say in their heart, aha, our desire. Do not let them say we have swallowed him up. Because to defeat David would be to cast disdain upon the name of God in the eyes of the pagan nations. So he expresses the imprecation. The word imprecatory imprecation means curses, uh, God's judgment upon them. Let them be ashamed and dishonored who seek my life. Let those be turned back and humiliated who devise evil against me. Let them be like chaff before the wind. 
with the angel of the Lord driving them on, let their way be dark and slippery with the angle, I think it should be angel of the Lord pursuing them. For without cause they hid their net for me, without cause they dug a pit for my soul. Let destruction come upon, my, upon him unawares, and let the net which he hid cast himself into that very destruction. Let him fall. So what can we say about these imprecatory psalms? So let me give you a couple things that, that, I, that I don't have here in my notes that... You know, what, do, what, what is the purpose of these imprecatory psalms? Well, the first thing I think we could say is they do demonstrate God's justice and God's righteous judgment toward the wicked. And you could jot down Psalm 58, verse 11. And this is a part of God, God's wrath. And we do not apologize for who God is. Uh, there is no dark side of the moon with God. God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. I shudder when I hear preachers say, well, this is the dark side of God. There is no dark side of God. He is perfect light. And God's wrath is a beautiful display of who He is. Psalm 58, 11. And these imprecatory psalms show the authority of God over the wicked. Psalm 59 verse 13, that history is not a tug-of-war between God and the ungodly as if God needs help in winning this tug-of-war, that God is sovereign in the heavens and He appoints the eternal destinies of His enemies. Third, these serve the purpose actually to be evangelistic to lead the wicked to seek the Lord. Psalm 83, verse 16. Oh God, threaten them so that they might come to you and know you. God, speak to them in your fury so that they will tremble before you and do homage to you and show reverence to you. And so the psalmist's heart is not simply that, well, God just damn them forever, but that in this imprecation that they might be driven to your grace to seek you. And then also, the purpose of these imprecations is to cause the righteous to praise God. I mean, do the righteous praise God because of the display of His wrath? Absolutely. That's what the Hallelujah Chorus is. Revelation uh, 19, uh, those opening verses. Um, hallelujah, verse 1, salvation and glory and power belong to our God. Why do we say hallelujah? Verse 2, because His judgments are true and righteous, for He has judged the great harlot who was corrupting the earth and with her immorality, he has avenged the blood of his bondservants on her. Hallelujah! Her smoke rises up forever and ever. They, they are bursting forth in praise in heaven because of her smoke rising up out of the pit of hell. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshiped God who sits on the throne saying, Amen, hallelujah, because God has judged the harlot. There is a sense in which our hearts need to praise God even for His wrath as God does what is right, as God punishes sin and proves himself to remain holy and to remain pure. You know, we say if an earthly judge knowingly overlooks a condemned man's guilt, then the judge becomes guilty and an accomplice in the crime. 
if God was to ever knowingly overlook any sin in the history of the world and fail to judge it, God would topple from his throne of holiness. Every sin in the history of the world will be judged by God. Every sin will either be punished in hell or pardoned in Christ. But every sin will be punished by a righteous and holy God. Not one half of the smallest sin will ever be swept under the carpet by God and God look away from it. Every sin will be punished by God in the history of mankind, either in hell or in Christ on the cross. And so these imprecatory psalms are merely the psalmist interceding with God to be God and to put His glory on display. And in the psalmist's heart is a desire, God, if they will not be saved, judge them. But even use your fury to awaken within them their finiteness that they might come and bow before you. Um, I know this is uh, later in the course we're going to talk about application, but um, especially here, when we get into some sticky situations where people have used these to, uh, um, I'm, I'm the righteous one and those people yeah. are against me. Uh, we yeah. Talk about it now. No, I mean, let's talk about it. Yeah, I mean, I, I think we, like, if someone's after us in the church for the scripture reading, you know, for the worship service, I mean, we can't read an imprecatory psalm and then wink, and then wink at them. <laughs> I mean, that's like misusing the scripture and misusing the pulpit. And you know, as the the reformers taught the analogy of Scripture. We interpret Scripture with Scripture, and as Thomas Watson said, as only a diamond is sharp enough to cut another diamond, only Scripture is sharp enough to interpret Scripture. And taking in the full counsel of God, Jesus said that we are to pray for those who persecute us and to love our enemies. And even Jesus upon the cross is not spouting out these imprecations, but there are, there are words of mercy coming from his lips. And even when Judas rose up to betray him, he handed him a morsel of bread, as if to extend even common grace kindness to Judas as he went out into the night to betray the Lord. And so... Yeah, we, we, we cannot use these as a trump card with people and say, well, then the Lord judge you and the Lord damn you type of thing. Uh, God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but to save the world. And we are to be um, messengers of God's good news. Yes. Not necessarily our immediate situations. Yes. Yes. I, I think we have to, Romans 12, we have to leave vengeance with the Lord. And that, you know, we are to heap, you know, coals upon the heads of others and, you know, return their insults to us. We are to return, you know, blessing to them as they would insult us. Uh, we are to turn the other cheek. Um, we are not to come down to their level and, um, you know, we are to take the high road. I mean, these are sticky psalms and, and we must preach them pastorally and very carefully. But I think they are to hear the thunder of these psalms. And we don't hit the mute button when we preach them. They are to contain all of their thunder as we preach them. But we are to preach them 
desiring that sinners under the wrath of God would flee to Christ for salvation and be saved in Him. what you just said with uh, the end of Psalm 137 with verse 9. <laughs> Thank you for bringing that up. Um, <laughs> illustrate. <laughs> illustrate. How would, you, how would you go through this verse in, in the context of preaching it and bridging, <laughs> bridging the New Testament in, which is, of course, very legitimate. But just how? Yeah, sure. Well, I was hoping to get out of the class without being asked this question. I was hoping to go visit with Dr. Barrick first before <laughs> I report into the drill sergeant before I speak to you. Well, Psalm 137 verse 9, how blessed will be the one who sieges and dashes your little ones against the rock. That's not one to put on your refrigerator, you know. <laughs> The verse of the week for us here at home. Don't you even think about opening that refrigerator door, kids. <laughs> no more jello for you, all right? We're going to dash you. Well, I think what we need to understand is part of the historical background here that, you know, beginning in verse 1, by the rivers of Babylon, when we sat down and wept, when we remembered Zion. Uh, this is a, a, a sad song of lament as well. Uh, the people of God have been uprooted out of their land. They've been taken off into Babylonian captivity. They have hung their harp on the willow tree. They, uh, the, the Babylonians have taunted them and mocked them and sing us your little hymns, sing us your little psalms. And they're too crushed within their heart to even reply and to sing for their food as they're being mocked and taunted by the people of God. It would almost be casting their pearls before swine to respond to these overtures, to sing to their God. And so, in an attempt to strengthen and build up their hearts being in captivity, it is to remind themselves that God will deal with them as they have dealt with us. They have dashed our babies upon the rocks. They have slaughtered our wives. They have carted us off to be their slaves. They have destroyed the temple of our God. They have defiled the most holy place. God, deal with them according to their deeds. And so this is a sense of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth in that the punishment should fit the crime. And this is what they have done to God as they have mocked and defi defiled the name of God and crushed the babies of the people of God. And so, in essence, as they have sown, so may they reap. As they have cast seeds of iniquity, may they reap their own seeds and their own harvest, Matt. But it is not the psalmist rising up to do this. It is simply calling upon God to serve justice for what has already been done vindictively against the people of God. And God will do this whether in this life or in the life to come. Matt? Um, there, there also seems to be a uh, strong covenantal aspect to a lot of these because they are the people of God, like you just said. They are the, the, the people of the covenant. And I think of other elsewhere where God says, not for your sake, but for my name's sake, I will save you. Um, you know, they've been a very unworthy people, but nonetheless he set his love upon them, he's made his covenant with them. And it, it, it appears as I've read these over the times that, you know, to to shame David is to shame the name of the Lord. And, right. you know, and so it, would, would you agree with that? Oh, totally, completely. This is not about David. This is about the name of the Lord. 
I mean, it's like if someone attacks you as you minister in his name, there's a sense in which we just must choose to suffer unjustly. And we do not retaliate and we do not um, seek their vengeance. But as you would de defame the name of God, for that I will go into the temple and be filled with zeal. For you have made my father's house a house of merchandise. Jesus, when people uh, assaulted him and said, you are the son of Beelzebub and you have a demon, uh, Jesus never vindicated. But when he saw what they were doing to the glory of God, when he saw what they were doing to the house of God and making a mockery of it, that's when he went in and cleaned house. And so all of this is just playing off the glory of God and the name of God and has nothing to do with us personally or individually. And so I think we have to, you know, hold this in careful balance. And there's so much that needs to be brought to these imprecatory psalms of a fuller counsel of God than to, to just go in and swashbuckle our way and just leave carnage on the highway after preaching these. That, that would be to misuse the pulpit. I've heard Dr. <coughs> Excuse me. I've heard Dr. MacArthur say that uh, he's prayed in precatory songs on people. Now, it's obviously wrong to say that to someone, Yeah. Um, but in your own heart, with the same heart that's being expressed here as far as God judges them so that they will repent, how does how do it work out personally? Yeah, I think that when we are in our private place before God, that we can pray that God would um, execute His justice uh, upon enemies of the gospel. But I think coupled with that, we must continue to pray for their salvation and pray that they come to faith in Christ and that pray that even expressions of God's fury would drive them to the cross where God's wrath was most fully put on display. But, uh, you know, there have been people who have risen up against me and risen up against the church, and I really, I don't think, have been bitter against them, but my heart has been broken for what they have done to defame the name of God in this town and defame the name of Christ and so, God, would you deal with them simply so your name can be preserved in this town? I mean, they can stomp on me all they want, chew me up, spit me out. I mean, that's, you know, that's a whole different matter. But God, preserve your name in this place. Build your church here, God. And if, if these who are in the way must be removed by you, if they must come to an early death... I mean, whatever, God, so that your kingdom may move forward. So I, I think that's the heart, you know, that we would pray, but it's, but it's not with a, a vengefulness in our heart. It's almost with tears coming down our cheek. I mean, it's kind of like, you know, when we preach on hell, I mean, we, we, we don't need to preach as if we're glad about it. You know, we need to be like Jesus weeping over Jerusalem. If you'd only come... You know. Mm -hmm. Is the word he in verses 8 and 9 referring to God? In Psalm 137? Yes. I don't know who the he is referring to there. What do you think the he is referring to there? Well, it has to be God, in my, at least indirectly. Part of the problem is my translation doesn't have he. Uh, I have the one. Uh, how, how blessed will be the one who seizes and dashes your little ones. Um, and in verse 8, I have how blessed will be the one who repays you. Yeah, I, I think for us in New Testament times, yeah, I, I mean, it, it's like, I mean, we, we, I mean we, we can't go out and murder people, you know, who have, let's say, murdered our own son. 
I mean, we have to let the government act on our behalf. I mean, another must be the executor of this, not us, someone else. And in this case, yes, God must be the executor of this. I mean, we, I mean, we can't go out and, you know, be the executor of this. So, I mean, we can't even go to an abortion clinic and shoot somebody, you know. I mean, we must make our appeal to government and for those in authority to do this. Alan. Um, what would your advice be to um, us as we, as we preach through the Psalms, as far as coming to an imprecatory psalm, would you take a week and define what an imprecatory psalm is and talk through the nature of those, or would you jump straight into one, or how would you? For me, first of all, there's not a right or a wrong way. For me, I would just have it in the introduction and just load it up in the introduction there's a sense in which, I don't know, I mean, I, I don't know that I want to draw, again, I, I don't want to draw more attention to the imprecatory psalms than I do to the praise psalms, and so if I do this introduction for the imprecatory psalms, I'm, I'm almost going to feel bound by some sense of symmetry and balance to have done the same for the praise psalm. It's like I was saying with, with some of the men at lunch yesterday, uh, I mean, for however worked up we become in preaching God's justice, we need to be all the more fervent in preaching on His grace and His mercy. And, and sometimes for us who are high justice, low mercy, it's easy to come into one of these psalms and just be Moses coming down from Sinai and, and, and to be overbearing. And then we come to a, a psalm of God's mercy and His grace and, 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 and not to have the same fervency and the same intensity. So I don't know, whatever I, if, I, if I did that with the imprecatory psalm, I know with me, with my own heart, then I almost feel like I would need to do the same for these other type of psalms. So as I would come to imprecatory psalm, I think I would just, in the introduction, I, I think in order to be provocative, I, 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 would, I would take my Bible and I would read Psalm 137 and I would end with verse 8 and 9 and I would just look up and say, what are we going to do with this? And I think everyone would just be in suspense, I, and I would almost milk it by saying, so are we to, you know, to take babies and just dash their heads into rocks? Is that what this is saying? Are we to? And I would just kind of layer that out, and, and people are almost like ready to say, well, tell us, what are we going to do? And I would try to contextualize it. Does this allow us to go into abortion clinics and, and kill abortionists and et cetera, et cetera? Um, and... I would, I would then say, well, let me tell you, before we get into this psalm, let me tell you four things about imprecatory psalms, which this is. And uh, people would be scurrying to, to write it down. And we need to keep this in perspective in the full counsel of God. And I would lay that in, in the introduction. And what you want in the introduction, I, I remember Haddon Robinson told us in class before he kind of went off in his different direction, but in class, he would tell us, you ought to do your introduction and then be able to sit down and people would want you to get back up and give the message. That there ought to be something in the introduction that, all right, I want to hear the message now. That, that there would be a, some kind of a hook. And so I, I think if you just merely read this and what are we going to do with this and then sat down... They're not going to leave the building till you get back up and tell us, so what are we going to do with this psalm? So that would be a good way, I think, to build suspense in the introduction. And I, I don't know, I, I think that if, if we did a whole message on it, I'm just saying this off the top of my head, I don't know, it's almost like, I mean, it bugs me if I preach on Antichrist and it's, and it's standing room only and I preach on Christ and the building is half full. I mean, it ought to be the other way around, and, and yet there's this strange curiosity within men that, like, slow down to look at a, at a car wreck, you know, and, and pack the place out to preach on Antichrist, but the glories of Christ himself, there's not the interest. I, I don't, I don't want to feed that, and so I also don't want to feed this on the imprecatory psalms, like you would be more interested in the imprecatory psalm than you would be in some of these other psalms that declare His loving kindness and His mercy. So when you walk away from my preaching, I want you to walk away 
not so much under the pew and under the wrath of God and the cursings of God. I mean, we are ministers of the new covenant and we bring good news to people and we want them to leave out being pointed to Christ and pointed to salvation. And, and we are merchants of hope and we are giving people the only hope there is in Christ. And so, I don't know, as I would work that out, I just, I, I just wouldn't want to be known as... as is as you know the, the imprecatory psalm pastor you know and <laughs> and now I've done a series of five messages overviewing the category of imprecatory psalms you know and and that's what I'm known by I, I'd rather be known by the triumph of His grace. So, is there a sense of, of uh, imprecatory psalms and, and uh, like Jonah's attitude and Habakkuk's attitude? Uh, the, basically the Jewish uh, lack of evangelistic uh, spirit versus God's attitude. I mean, you see God sent Jonah to witness to the Assyrians or, you know, the Ninevites. And he's, he's sent, you know, I, I, I don't think we preach the imprecatory Psalms and then cast criticism on them that, like, well, they just lack a heart for God. I, I think there's a purity about them, and so I don't think we apologize for the imprecatory psalms and say, well, they, he obviously has no evangelistic heart for the Babylonians. I don't, I don't think we say that. I, I think that's to read in what is not there and to make assumptions that are, are not stated. Is there a way to balance it, though? I mean, you would show this to the people. Wouldn't you want to show that that's not the psalmist's attitude that he wants to just go out there and be... Well, I, I would turn to some of these other places where the psalmist says, let the nations be glad. And that our bringing... You know, the nations can't be glad until they know God, and they can't know God until one be sent. And, and the sent one must bring the message. And so our desire is that the nations would, be, would find their fulfillment and gladness in the Lord himself. And so I would, I would add that to preaching. I would probably put all of that in the conclusion of the message as, as I bring this to an end and, and, and really end with the cross and show people that God has poured out His wrath upon His own Son and all of God's imprecations and, and cursings upon those who would believe have been poured out upon Christ at the cross and, and, and I would, would end in that way. And God today is extending to you His mercy and His grace, but if you refuse it, God's imprecation will come upon your head in the last day. So I think I would hold it for the end and end with a gospel appeal. And, and I would pray the night before and ask that God would break my own heart and give me a contrite spirit and give me humility as I would, would preach this. And at the end, if God would just give me the burden of the Lord in reaching these people for Christ as I would preach this, that would be what I would, would, would do. Uh, I think what you're saying is it seems right that, that the, the implications uh, would seem to establish something that may be lost, especially in this time, of a concern and a zeal for God's glory and His justice and His holiness. I mean, that, that, that seems to be what is crying out of their hearts. Yes. Uh, which would be certainly appropriate in this season uh, of a general pluralism and intolerance. Uh, and it would also protect our showing mercy and blessing our enemies from uh, something else that marks the age, and that's just sentimentality. Right. Uh, that, that the love that we show to men, we realize that they're under the judgment of God. And yes. indeed, God's justice cries out against them we realize that we ourselves are earnest for justice and know that it will be accomplished. And so our love for men is also uh, governed by that. We, we ourselves enter into the, you know, the same character of love that Christ had, uh, himself bearing justice you know, uh, and also dying for mercy, that we would go to men with the same kind of heart, not, uh, not compromising that justice, but also going out in mercy. I, uh, just one other thing in terms of the New Testament application of those things. How do we do it when we find ourselves confronted? Uh, you know, Acts chapter 4, uh, where uh, they themselves were instructed by the Sanhedrin, keep your mouth shut. They go back citing Psalm 2, knowing God is sovereign. 
that God does reign, and basically all they say is God take note of their threats and allow us to do our job. Yes. And, uh, and basically we leave it into your hands. Uh, you take care of justice. Help us to be faithful in proclaiming mercy. Yes. So. I couldn't agree anymore. Uh, it was very well put. Very well put. Statements like this from Scripture is always made me want to know the Lord better. And ask myself, the question I, I ask is, what is there about God that I don't understand that makes this an inspired statement? And I think that, uh, I remember I used to ask, and I've heard countless people ask, you know, how can God be this way? You know, it just doesn't make sense. And I think a lot of it is our culture. We don't understand God well enough, who He is, and the tension between our balance, however you want to say it, of his good, his justice, and his mercy. Amen. I, I, we do not worship a tame God. I mean, I think this fosters the fear of the Lord w within our hearts, and rightfully so. And we need to be reminded of this, that, that he is a God of vengeance and a God of wrath, a God of eternal vengeance. And, and, and really, the, 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 if there's a shock to this, it's not the temporal wrath of God that would be displayed in the killing of these babies. You know, it would be the eternal wrath of God for the adults that would be part of some display of wrath that would usher them into eternity forever under His wrath. Yeah. Stephen Ottaway is going to talk about uh, the reality of God expressing His just wrath, especially in such graphic terms as this. To me, it only highlights the reality of the abundance of His mercy, but why this does not happen every day. Because yeah. it could. Yeah. God could execute His wrath on a daily basis in justice. So I think these are times that just highlights the reality of the abundance of His mercy when we see the reality of the Tim, I, th I think that is a great perspective. Uh, I don't know if everyone could hear that, but, you know, I mean, God ought to be lowering the hammer every day. Um, you know, on the day that you sin, eat of this fruit, you shall surely die. I mean, as God suspends the display of His wrath from coming down upon people every moment, every day, um, it, should, it should astonish us that He has suspended these imprecations. And, 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 and impatience extended more time to sinners to come to Christ to be saved. That should astonish us. I mean, it's kind of like the doctrine of election. I mean, we shouldn't be astonished that God, you know, would choose. I mean, we should be astonished that God just didn't damn everyone, that He would choose even one person to be saved is mind-boggling, much less a vast multitude whom no man can number, and we should be astonished that He would choose us. I can understand that He would damn everyone in hell forever, what I can't understand is that he would choose sinners to know his son and know himself. I think just a good example for us to keep in mind is uh, Jonathan Edwards, Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. I think he, he does that in that sermon, balances out this aspect of God, but yet evangelistic as well. Amen. Um, holds forth the terror of God and then the, the light of his mercy and grace shining into that darkness becomes you know, attractive to sinners to, to flee to Christ for salvation. So, I, amen to that. Dr. Mills, where do you find help uh, in interpreting the imprecatory Psalms with the thought that because this is pre-Christ, pre-atonement, they didn't have categories for how justice and mercy would converge, whereas us on the other side of the cross have the ability to extend mercy because justice has been satisfied. Is, is that an oversimplification in your mind? Do you think that does justice to the weight of God's holiness and judgment that you'd want to bring out in preaching a preparatory song? I, I don't think that that, Bob, removes the tension that we're feeling in our heart that this was pre-cross and now we're post-cross. And so now there is no imprecation and now there is no justice. I mean... It, it, it's like John 3, 36. I mean, right now the wrath of God abides on every unbeliever. And so just the fact that, that God so loved the world, He gave His only begotten Son, it, it's not that now just God's happy with everybody, you know, on this side of the cross. 
uh, is, God is angry with the wicked every day. And, and, and the wrath of God has been revealed from heaven, or is being revealed, present tense, from heaven against all unrighteousness. And so God's wrath is, uh, even on this side of the cross, abides on every unbeliever. And so I, I, I don't think that that actually removes the tension that we're feeling because there's still the tension of God's wrath and God's love on this side of the cross. Also a verse in response to that, uh, Revelation 6.10, speaking of the martyrs, yeah. the sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Yeah, I mean, here are glorified saints in heaven, perfected, in the image of Christ, no sin in heaven, and these saints around the throne and under the throne crying out an imprecatory prayer to God to have to avenge the blood of the martyrs here upon the earth. I mean, that's a perfect, pure prayer that's being offered in glory from perfectly glorified people. So I, I don't think we water down the imprecatory psalms and just say, well, he, he wasn't evangelistic and he needs to be evangelistic. I think that's an oversimplification. Here are, here are glorified people in heaven praying these. 